good morning and uh, or any other time of the day that uh, uh, that where you are. And uh, so I'm delighted to start this webinar by introducing first myself. I'm Sasha Tarkovsky. I am uh, uh, head of the laboratory for um, immune cell epigenetic with signaling at the Rockefeller University. Um, it's a pleasure for me to welcome uh, this morning uh, Women in Science webinar, um, Dr. Kate Jeffrey, uh, who joined us from uh, Harvard University, MGH. And this is particularly uh, exciting for me to uh, welcome Kate because I was uh, um, privileged to be Kate's supervisor for several years when Kate was a postdoc in my However, before I introduce Kate, I would like to say a few words about uh, Rockefeller University, and uh, especially for those of you who perhaps know not enough about the university or would like to know more. So Rockefeller is a pretty remarkable place in many ways, and it carries, first of all, a vision of uh, John D. Rockefeller, who founded the university in 1901, uh, with a very clear mission to bridge a gap between the understanding of uh, basic knowledge of human diseases or just basic biology and, uh, and relatively poor human ability to track and treat human uh, diseases. So um, the Institute has been built with an idea to bring to use science for the benefit of humanity, a credo that uh, has been carried by universities since the start. Uh, this has been a remarkably successful journey because despite the fact that uh, Rockefeller community is rather small and has only about 70 labs on campus, which is one of the most beautiful campus I have ever seen, and I guess it's true for many others of my colleagues, uh, this campus brought to life uh, an incredible number of discoveries and uh, nurture a large number of truly outstanding investigators who carry with them uh, sort of the spirit of Rockefeller in many different ways. Uh, I don't want to talk about Nobel Prizes that are many, many other awards, uh, but uh, that's so known as Rockefeller being technically a factory producing discoveries year after year. Uh, one of the reasons why this is uh, actually possible because Rockefeller nurtures highly interactive, so a lot of interaction between different labs and small groups is very non-hierarchical place where students and uh, scientists of all ranks can interact pretty freely in a, in a way that perhaps is truly unique uh, for the university. Uh, this collaborative environment brought to life, as I say, many discoveries and most recently, it was sort of a, a, a major effort by many science and university, including my lab, that play a minor contribution to this, to join forces to understand the mechanism and uh, pathology of, uh, of current uh, of, of COVID virus and disease associated with it. Um, uh, I must say that by all criteria, university achieve a major breakthrough in this direction. Uh, and uh, as a university in, university in general, me in particular, very proud of major discoveries, including this identification of neutralizing antibody against COVID, as well as very basic principle of the disease that have been happened only because Rockefeller happened to be one of those most dynamic, interactive, collaborative spaces. So what is also really important about Rockefeller and is part of the topic of what, what uh, part, part of the reason why we're here today um, is uh, that it is one of the places we truly recognize a major significance of women in science and put a, a truly outstanding effort to support women in science. Um, I remember very vividly my interaction with um, uh, Mary Jean Creek, uh, who passed away last year, but who was one of the most outstanding neuroscientists uh, in this country and perhaps in the world. And she was also among the very first women, women who broke this glass ceiling and became faculty member. And with her and uh, the, the whole era 
of absolutely remarkable women in science development started at Rockefeller University. Uh, we have a large cohort of women who achieve, who made major discovery, like Tita DeLong or Corey Bartman. Uh, we also have a younger generation of scientists like Vanessa Ruta, who really paves currently the way for better understanding of how central nervous system in particular function works. Uh, this uh, achievements are not are fully recognized by community and our uh, outstanding women scientists are honored by membership in National Academy of Science by different prizes, uh, membership in, uh, in Harvard Hughes Institute and so on and so forth. And uh, to name few women who really make our university very proud, uh, Leslie Wosko, Mary Beth Hatton, and, and of course, Corey Barman, who actually recently got awarded uh, a salt medal, uh, a rem remarkable achievement, uh, usually given to outstanding individuals for their research uh, excellence. Um, overall, the Institute has sort of, in my opinion, a mission to really help, uh, to really achieve a equality, if you wish, in giving women maximum opportunity to do wonderful science and build their careers. Um, um, I cannot just stop thinking while giving this introduction about Paul Greener, uh, a wonderful friend and uh, our very, very special colleague who led the lab for neuroscience at the university. And Paul and his wife, uh, started a program supporting women in, in, in science by donating uh, the Nobel Prize, a portion of Nobel Prize to start a special program and a prize in women in science, a initiative that brings every year to campus uh, various scientists who just demonstrate how successful women can be if they're properly uh, sort of supported by a community. So let's, uh, all of this is wonderful to know about the Rockefeller University and uh, all this sort of, I'm, as I'm talking about this, I really have a very strong feeling how much Rockefeller actually does to support women. Uh, what I have been privileged for my entire life to have really wonderful uh, postdocs and students in lab and uh, many of them are women. And Kate is one of them. And Kate came from Australia. Uh, she distinguished herself from the beginning by being extremely independent, extremely sort of future oriented and very positive in her attitude uh, towards science. Uh, because of that, because of her attitude and because of her sort of uh, spirit, it became possible for us to do some uh, to do really novel research and brought to life a, a new generation of drugs actually, who now have been cited more than I think 2000 times. And this is a new generation of drugs that tackle so-called epigenetic processes in uh, cells of various types to interfere with many kinds of diseases, including inflammation, cancer, diabetes, and so on and so forth. And I must say that without Kate being a part of the research team doing this, uh, this research would not have happened. And our paper that was published in Nature about 10 years ago and basically started the whole field would not have been possible. So very grateful Kate for being who she is. And, uh, and she went on. She left the lab to become uh, uh, an independent investigator in Harvard. Uh, she first, uh, you know, at Massachusetts General Hospital she started there uh, as usual assistant professor and progressed now to, through the ranks to become associate professor. She's working in, in the field of immunology and virology. Uh, she has broad interest in this field and that sort of lead to her association with Broad Institute, MIT and other Harvard institutions that are keenly interested in understanding mechanisms of human diseases, especially those which are linked to um, inflammation. Her interest, uh, tightly connected to what she has studied in my lab and continue to study later. And something that through years became one of the mainstream of, let's say, scientific enterprise in many different institutions, namely epigenetic mechanism of immune regulation. 
Uh, I won't be, I don't have time, and I think Kate would do better you know, that, uh, to discuss what epigenetic is and why is it important. I leave it up to Kate. But overall, it's tough to talk, not being there in person, not to see Kate in person, but just to, and not being able to just basically see how wonderful she developed. But nevertheless, Zoom is okay. And I'm very helpful that I have the opportunity to introduce Kate on this occasion and hope that there will be a time uh, when we can do it in person. So Kate, uh, I'm be all uh, exceptionally delighted to have you this morning and I look forward to hearing about your exciting work. And at this point, uh, Kate, the stage is yours and thank you all. Thank you, Sasha, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and I also want to second that sentiment of, you know, how much Rockefeller University has supported women, um, not only during my time there, um, but, you know, how many women it continues to produce in, in sort of very senior and influential roles in science. Um, and, and, and really how that, you know, has me personally has, uh, has really affected my career. So today I am going to um, give a sort of a large overview of some thoughts uh, that we have in the field and in my lab about these uh, so-called diseases of affluence and age. Um, and by that, I mean uh, mostly inflammatory diseases that seem to be uh, very prominent in Western industrialized uh, societies. And to put that in another perspective is, you know, how do we understand human immune diseases in the post-genomic era? So we have sequenced the human genome and we found that there's a few genes that associate with these immune diseases, but there's, there's many other layers on top of this. And, and so how do we immunologists uh, try to address these uh, chronic disorders? So this is a, it's a strange slide to put up having just endured a pandemic, but I think it's, you know, something positive is that, you know, us humans are really living much longer than we ever had throughout history. You know, the average life expectancy of, of women is well over 80. Um, we did see a, almost a year and a half drop during the pandemic due to the, you know, awful uh, deaths of so many people around the world. But um, without, you know, removing pandemics, and I'll get to that in a moment, um, the life expectancy of us humans continues to rise. Now that comes with um, some, you know, pros and cons. And the, one of the main reasons that our life expectancy continues to rise is really the reduction in infectious diseases. And again, it is a strange time to put up this slide, but you have to put things into historical perspective. We as immunologists have controlled a large number of infectious diseases that throughout history have killed humans in large numbers. Um, and I highlight a few here, rheumatic fever, hepatitis, mumps, measles, smallpox, all of these have um, been essentially eliminated from the population and humans no longer die of these infectious diseases. And this will be true for SARS-CoV-2 as well. I just wanna highlight what a scientific triumph the last two years has been or well, we really, a year, immunologists managed to create a vaccine against this particular virus. And really this pandemic has become now a pandemic of the unvaccinated. So these vaccinations are really reducing the risk of dying by uh, COVID-19 by more than 11 fold. And so hopefully, um, you know, we can add SARS-CoV-2 to this, to this slide here, where the, the rates of deaths will continue to decrease over time. But having um, now this ability to control uh, infectious diseases, one great concern of the population now that we are living longer and we are living in Western industrialized societies is this rise in these so-called complex immune diseases. And by that, I mean, they are not caused by a single infectious agent. These are complex diseases resulting from the way in which we live, the environment in which we live, um, and I highlight multiple sclerosis, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, such as Crohn's disease. We, of course, all know that allergies are on the rise. Now, these are a much greater challenge for us immunologists of how to not only treat, but try to cure these diseases because it's not a single uh, pathogen that's causing these diseases. So we can't necessarily vaccinate uh, against these diseases. 
And so I just wanted to, you know, make you aware of uh, how we treat infectious diseases. And this has its, like everything in science has a connection to Rockefeller. So Koch's postulate, so Koch was a, a German physician that proposed that infectious diseases really has to be, if, if it's caused by an infectious agent, um, you should see it in the people that have that disease. And those uh, people should be able to pass that infectious agent and the people that receive that infectious agent then get the disease. And so we can clearly put the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic into the Koch's postulate category. It's, a, it's clearly a single pathogen causing this disease and then we can try and vaccinate against it. And just to put this into the history of Rockefeller, so William Welch actually uh, trained with Koch and at the time Germany was a it was a beacon of, uh, of, of science and medicine. And William Welch um, then came back to the US and went to Johns Hopkins. And of course, now we have the Welch Hall uh, at Rockefeller. So many, many things have a connection uh, to Rockefeller University. So Koch's postulate, we can take that and try to create vaccines against that infectious agent. But unfortunately for these more complex human uh, immune disorders, we don't have that clear cut trigger. We don't have a single pathogen that's causing these diseases. What we do know is that they are rising. We know that more than uh, 50 million Americans are currently afflicted with more than 150 immune mediated diseases. So these chronic inflammatory diseases. Um, it doesn't get as much attention, I would say, as, as cancer. Um, the healthcare costs, though, of these diseases are about two times that of cancer. Um, and it gets about a tenth of the funding of cancer. Um, but to put that into perspective, uh, if you take inflammatory bowel disease, there's about 100,000 new cases of inflammatory bowel disease every single year in the United States. And I put that, this is the Melbourne Cricket Ground in Melbourne. Uh, this is 100,000 people being diagnosed uh, with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis every single year. And we really have no great treatments for these diseases. 75% uh, of Crohn's disease uh, patients will actually physically get their inflamed intestine removed by surgery. So what is it about these complex immune diseases not caused by a single trigger, not a pathogenic agent, not caused by a single gene? Um, well, we don't really know exactly what the trigger is. What we do know is that the, the incidence of these diseases is rapidly rising, but specifically in Western industrialised societies. So if you take uh, the United States, Europe, uh, my homeland of Australia, they have the highest rates of these complex inflammatory immune disorders in the world. And so there's something about that Western lifestyle that seems to be triggering these diseases. Now, there's been a lot of hypotheses. Is it because we're eating less fibre? Is it because we're exposed to different environmental pollutants? Um, and it's, it's likely that many of these things are contributing. But our job as immunologists is trying to find that Achilles heel that's triggering this inflammation, even if we don't know exactly what's um, the external uh, environmental cue. So our immune system. We've heard a lot about it. Everyone's now become an expert immunologist in the last couple of years. Um, our immune system's main job is to protect us from infection, protect us from viruses, from bacteria and other environmental uh, stimuli. And our immune system is those white blood cells, about um, 50,000 of them per drop of your blood. Um, and they roam around the body um, which makes them actually unique of all cell types in the body, roaming around, being exposed to all different environmental stimuli and protecting us uh, in the best way that it can. And our immune system is very, very ancient. Our innate immune system, which is the first line of defence, has been around for pretty much since life. Um, many, many organisms just use this first line of defence. And then about 450 million years ago, organisms developed adaptive immunity. So this idea of um, a, a memory in our immune system that of course we um, leverage uh, with vaccines, this, this whole idea of being exposed to something and memorizing it. So how is it that our immune system that is so evolved, have been around for so long, how is it now that it's starting to be maladapted and to start to harm us um, and leading to these, these chronic inflammatory diseases? 
And so one aspect of this we think that may be uh, very important um, for the development of these uh, complex immune disorders is, is something called epigenetics. Uh, and epigenetics, of course, another aspect of science that has a, has a very strong connection to Rockefeller University. David Alice uh, at Rockefeller was the, you know, one of the first to, to uh, identify these modified histones of which DNA is wrapped around as a regulator of gene expression. So what is epigenetics? Well, every cell in our body has two metres of DNA that's wrapped uh, tightly around these proteins called histones. And these histones have these unstructured tails that protrude out and they uh, are modified in, in many different ways. And it's the modifications of these histones that really controls the organisation of our DNA and which genes get turned on, which genes get turned off and which genes are inducible and the timing in which uh, they're inducible. And so the best way to describe it is that every single cell type in our body has the exact same stretch of DNA that we inherited from our parents. So how is it that we have so many different cell types and so many different gene expression patterns? So the genome is constant across all cell types, but we have very cell type specific gene expression that cannot be explained by a DNA sequence. So if you take our immune cells, each immune cell has a very unique gene expression pattern. And that is dictated by those, that epigenetics, the way in which that DNA is organized in 3D in the nucleus, wrapped around those histones that are modified. And so it controls that extra layer or additional layer of gene expression. Your genes are inherited, but the way in which they're expressed in a cell type specific manner is controlled by these epigenetic or chromatin mechanisms. So I like to use the piano as an analogy to control epigenetics. Um, so this is my grandmother, Kathleen Jeffrey was my namesake. Um, she was actually a professional pianist. Um, and no one in my family are really scientists. So I'm always trying to explain what do I do every day? Um, and so I like to use the piano. So if you take all 88 keys of a piano as being your DNA, then epigenetics are the piano player or the allowing certain keys of that piano being played at the right time. So here's a piano. We all know the piano. This is our DNA. If you take an immune cell, in order for it to be an immune cell, it has to have certain keys being played in order for it to take that cell identity on and that gene expression profile that, that gives that cell that identity and function. And you can imagine every single cell type has this unique keys being turned on, but also equally importantly, all those keys that are kept silent. Many, many, um, many, many uh, genes and many parts of your genome are kept silent in a cell type specific way in order for those cells to have that identity and function. And so that is um, an, an essential layer of, of gene regulation that we have, but why do we care about it in the context of these complex immune disorders? Well, the interesting thing about epigenetics, um, largely unlike our fixed genome, is that epigenetics are adapted or actually often maladapted to environmental cues. And so if you take immune cells, as I alluded to, that are moving around the body, constantly being exposed to things, we know that pollutants, allergens, medications, pathogens, diet and lifestyle can all actually contribute to our epigenome in unique ways. And so we can have changes in our epigenome or, or changes in these histones that are being acquired because of the things that we're exposed to. Now, the challenge for us as immunologists is understanding which one of those environmentally driven epigenetic changes are maintained and which of them are actually triggering disease. And so we do know that there is a, there is a connection to these lifestyle or these environmentally induced epigenetic uh, changes and the development of immune disease. And so how can we try to understand, even if we don't understand exactly what the environmental cue is for these complex immune diseases, can we find this, this, this sort of Achilles heel in immune cells that we can try to reset that epigenome back to normal to reduce inflammation? And so I'll just show you a couple of examples that um, my lab and, and collaborations with other labs um, have explored this area. So we did a wonderful collaboration with uh, Matthias Narendorf at, um, at MGH, Massachusetts General Hospital, 
where actually he allowed mice to voluntarily exercise and they jump on this running wheel and actually run up to about 10K a day. If only I had that much motivation. And we took the um, uh, hematopoietic stem cells from those mice and looked at their epigenome. And what was pretty remarkable was that those mice that were exercising had huge changes in their immune epigenome. And actually, even once uh, we took those mice off um, those wheels and they went back to a sedentary lifestyle, every, many of those epigenetic changes were actually main, maintained for quite a significant period. And this had large impact on, um, on, on monocyte or, or a specific immune cell uh, development called a macrophage. And in my own lab, uh, we've been exploring different environmental cues. We know so much about the microbiome, those commensal bacteria uh, that live in our gut. It turns out actually we have many viruses that uh, exist within our gut, so-called uh, virome. And going against our um, thoughts that all viruses are actually harmful, it turns out that some of those viruses that live amongst us um, in our intestine can actually have um, beneficial effects on our immune system and actually uh, educate our immune system in positive ways, much like the bacteria in our gut. We've never lived without them. And some of these bacteria, actually we've shown um, in, um, in mice, if we took um, viruses that we isolated from colon resections taken from uh, non-IBD or, or patients with inflammatory bowel disease, we could isolate those viruses. And we gave them to mice and actually showed in blue here that the um, viruses coming from a healthy intestine very much protected from inflammation, whereas viruses coming from either ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease individuals um, very much provoked inflammation. And we've been uh, now trying to understand uh, exactly how these viruses are educating our host immunity um, via the epigenome. And it's, uh, there's been some, not just us, there's been a, a number of, of studies now looking at how, how our immune epigenome is, is influenced uh, by our environment. And I should say that, you know, a large part of this field is really just as the techniques and the technology just get better and better. And we can, we can now um, look at the epigenome in, in, in more limited cells in, in greater detail. Um, and this study here out of a group from, from Stanford actually looked at those histone modifications in identical twins. And what they found was that in the immune cells, by the time these identical twins were 65 years of age, almost 70% of the immune epigenome was environmentally derived. So it's a really you know, amazing thought to think that two people born with the exact same DNA end up having this shift in the epigenome in their immune cells and could change the gene expression profile and behavior of those immune cells by what those individuals were exposed to throughout their life. So that's, you know, and that's a very, we're at the beginnings of understanding how the um, environmental factors that we are exposed to throughout our life in these industrialized societies can shape our epigenome in, in maladapted ways. I think we're still a long way of trying to understand which of those are maintained and, and, and can really be driving disease. Um, but another angle is understanding the actual epigenetic scribes or those enzymes in our body that actually place um, these, this epigenomic landscape in these cells and, and how they may actually be mutated in disease and contributing to disease. So we have these epigenetic scribes that we colloquially refer to as the writers, erasers and readers. And so all of these modifications, there's enzymes that put those modifications on, they're the writers. Many of these uh, epigenetic modifications are dynamic and can be erased, so we have the erasers. Um, and we also have this subclass of epigenetic enzymes called the readers, and these uh, essentially interpret or dock to these epigenetic uh, changes and, and bring um, protein complexes that control transcription. And it was really in Sasha's lab was this interest in these epigenetic readers uh, came about and, and could these be a contributing factor to disease and, and can we try to drug them uh, in inflammatory disease. And so work from my lab was um, we actually got very interested in this epigenetic reader called SP140. Um, and it's completely restricted to the immune system. So there's something about this epigenetic enzyme that has a designated role in immune cells. Um, and I should say that in cancer, we know that 
you know, there's many, many examples of mutations in these epigenetic enzymes as being a key driver of cancer. But I think in these chronic or complex immune disorders, there's really few examples. And, I, you know, so far we have, a, you know, very limited examples of, a, of mutations in epigenetic enzymes driving these uh, immune disorders. And so here we found uh, one example. So SP140, it turns out, is actually has mutations uh, within it that are lost in patients with inflammatory bowel disease and specifically Crohn's disease. Um, and this is a loss of function mutation of this epigenetic enzyme. And what happens is that um, if you lack this epigenetic enzyme, SP140, um, actually it does drive uh, intestinal inflammation. So this is a really key gatekeeper, gatekeeper epigenetic enzyme. Um, and when it's lost, uh, you end up developing um, so the chronic uh, inflammation in the gut. And like everything in science, when you start something new, you start scratching the surface and then there's more and more to discover. So it turns out that SP140 is part of a large family of these so-called SP proteins. And these are the, what the proteins look like. They possess these certain domains that allow them to uh, dock directly to those modified histones, to that epigenome, and regulate gene expression. And what's really fascinating about this whole family is that all of them in some way or another have an association uh, with human immune disease. And so either a loss uh, of SP110 results in a, a, an immunodeficiency, um, but these loss of function mutations in SP140 not only associates with inflammatory bowel disease, but also other complex immune disorders like multiple sclerosis and, a, and an adult leukemia, uh, CLL. And so this has become a great interest in the lab of really trying to understand the mechanism of this relatively new family of epigenetic regulators and how their loss uh, actually leads to immune disease. Um, and I sort of alluded to that idea that um, all those 88 keys of the uh, piano, many of them are silenced in each uh, cell type. And this is actually a, is a really key point of, of, of epigenetic control. And so if you take the human genome at 3.1 uh, gigabases, we've got about 21,000 genes. And if you take an immune cell, you might only have a, a couple of hundred genes that actually are induced in that cell after it's been exposed to an environmental cue, like, like a bacteria or a virus. Um, and so a large proportion of that human genome is really kept silent. And we think that SP140, this epigenetic regulator, is actually a key uh, gatekeeper of, of gene silencing. And it's keeping genes off. And when in patients with uh, Crohn's disease, they're losing this negative regulator, what we're seeing is that some of these uh, keys that are normally silenced of the piano are just starting to be turned on. And this is actually leading uh, to inflammation in these immune cells. And so being at, at MGH at a hospital, it's been fantastic because we can get access to um, patient uh, samples um, that are all genotypes. So we've, we've taken immune cells from Crohn's disease patients that lack uh, this epigenetic enzyme SP140, and we start to see real changes uh, in their epigenome. And we actually start to see derepression of a lot of this, uh, this silenced region. Um, actually to the point where normally you would have this really tightly closed DNA to avoid gene expression. And actually in these patients, you are to start to see this opening of that, of that DNA and you start to get essentially uh, incorrect gene expression in these immune cells uh, that ultimately leads to inflammation. And we start to see you know, um, a, a large increase in, in the changes of the epigenome and, and transcriptional program of these cells. And so here's one example of an epigenetic regulator um, that is lost and it has mutations within it that is actually a driver uh, of a complex immune disorder like inflammatory bowel disease. And so, you know, we sort of think about these um, complex immune diseases as really a, a triad of, of influences. Of course, we have our genes that we are born with and we have mutations in some of these genes that, that drive um, these uh, inflammatory disorders. So if you take inflammatory bowel disease, there's about 160 genes that have been associated with this disorder. But having one or um, many of these mutations doesn't guarantee you'll get the disease. There's an environmental component. And as I alluded to, these diseases are high in Western industrialized societies. So there's something about 
our microbiome, um, the pollutants that we're exposed to, our lack of fibre that's contributing to these diseases. And I like to think as epigenetics as this, this centre between the genes that we've inherited and the environment that we're exposed to and then the gene expression profile that actually, unfortunately, could be maladapted to lead to these uh, chronic inflammatory diseases. And so I think, you know, like everything in science, uh, technology is our friend. And as technologies become better and better, I mean, we've, we've sequenced the human genome. We, we can do that quite readily and quickly. And I think it's going to only become more and more realistic that we can also uh, sequence people's individual epigenetics and try to find that real Achilles heel that we can try to target. And the reason I bring that up is because it is a real possibility to try to reset our epigenome. Um, and this was work, as Sasha alluded to, which was just such an exciting time in the lab where we really um, understood that these epigenetic enzymes can be druggable. And so here's this example of an epigenetic reader that um, we found uh, that we could put a, a chemical compound in this enzyme um, and actually essentially control uh, the epigenome and control transcription. And in the presence of this uh, epigenetic inhibitor, we really quite dramatically switched off inflammation. And so this sort of became a, a very, very exciting new field of, of targeting these epigenetic drugs uh, for therapeutic benefit to try and reset the epigenome and, and try to bring particularly immune cells back to normal and to reduce that inflammation. And so in the case of our uh, of, of SP140, if we, if we make uh, knockout mice, so mice that lack uh, this epigenetic reader, uh, indeed they get um, really exacerbated intestinal inflammation. And so this is shown here in red by weight loss. But because now we can understand the mechanism of SP140, we can start to introduce uh, epigenetic modifying drugs. So in this case, type isomerase inhibitors um, that we can start to rescue that phenotype uh, back to normal um, with other epigenetic modifying drugs. And you can see here colon length, which is a, a, a sort of crude measure of, of inflammation. As the colon is inflamed, it becomes shorter. You can see here in red, in the absence of this epigenetic enzyme, s 40 you really get exacerbated intestinal inflammation and giving these um, type isomerase inhibitors that sort of close that chromatin back down and bring um, inflammation back down, uh, we can start to rescue this. And so here's one example where, you know, maybe a precision medicine approach is specifically for these Crohn's disease patients that lack sp 40 Can we start to think about tailoring um, epigenetic drugs for those to reset inflammation? And so with that, um, I will thank uh, all of the lab past and present that have contributed in various ways to these projects. We have a ongoing interest uh, in this topic, um, both environmental cues, the virome, and, and trying to target epigenetic enzymes uh, therapeutically for these immune diseases. I want to highlight Hadra here. I have men too, but many women in my lab. Uh, and I want to particularly uh, I highlight uh, the women in science at Rockefeller. I think it's fair to say that science is a meritocracy. The scientific content, I think, is a meritocracy. But I think the barriers for women in science are real, uh, both from whether it be childbearing years or preconceptions or whatever it is. I think it's, it's fair to say that um, these barriers are real. And so I, I really want to commend the Rockefeller Women in Science for su continuing to support women. Um, and with that, I think we have time for some questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kate, um, for very interesting, <clears throat> exceptionally interesting presentation. And I must say that before we start Q&A, um, um, your comparison to piano is pretty remarkable because there's a whole, um, let's say, movement uh, in, in effort to translate the genetic code into music. Um, there are many artists. And, uh, and historically, one of the most interesting uh, uh, composers uh, who try actually to think first about genetic code was John Cage. So it goes way, way back. Uh, so one of the most interesting, most unconventional 
intellectuals who ever work in music globally. And um, yeah, John Cage was the one who actually talked about this a little bit. So it was really exciting to see that you brought it. Oh, yes. good. And I just want to highlight what a typical, I just, you know, that's such a Sasha comment to make. <laughs> Sasha always has such an interesting angle and, and you know, uh, that is just, you've just witnessed that right there. So I think, uh, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's so typically Sasha, the way you think about things. Well, anyway, so we, we have time for, okay. we have time for questions and um, um, I'm just trying. Uh, okay. Um, I have a question from Carolyn Wiener uh, asking, uh, would fecal transplant reset the microbiome? Yeah, so um, that's a really active area of investigation. I mean, I think the faecal transplant data is um, very, very strong. Um, for C. difficile infection, um, I've seen data at MGH, it's almost 99% protection from faecal transfer. I think the jury's still out exactly whether it's going to be able to reset these more complex immune diseases. I think it's still got a long way to go of really trying to find the key bacteria that need to be in those donors for beneficial effects. Um, there's a lot of work being done in that space. Um, Romnick Xavier, Eric Alm, all up at MGH and uh, MIT. Um, I think the, the potential is really there. What I would like to highlight in that space is it's not just bacteria in these fecal transfers. There's fungus, there's or fungi, there's there's viruses, and I think our recent work has really shown that the viruses in our gut, both the bacteriophages and the eukaryotic viruses, really have a large impact on educating our host immunity um, autonomously to the to the microbiome, and so. Um, I would really hope that that becomes a, an angle that people look at when they're thinking about fecal transfer. All right. Uh, we have a very medical question um, uh, that uh, from Marilou Sello about more or less what are the signs and symptoms of uh, IBS and uh, when to see a doctor and so on and so forth. Um, and what to be eliminated from diet. So if you feel that you can answer this question. Uh, this is this is IBS, so in, in irritable yeah. bowel syndrome. Um, yeah, I think that might be a question for Daniel Mesita at Rockefeller. He's doing a lot of work in the neuroimmune interaction and what's triggering IBS. Uh, Sasha, you might be more equipped to answer that question than me. Well, I'm, I, I think it's a really difficult question to answer, especially when to see a doctor. Uh, I, I personally always try not to see a doctor as long as I can. So, <laughs> 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 no, but it's, it's the wrong answer, of course. But it's uh, no, but I think it's a bit difficult to be difficult question in the frame of a current presentation because we we uh, um, it's as Kate pointed out, uh, this is a assist a disorder which characterized by wide range of symptoms and uh, one cannot really so they are they I guess uh, it's a spectrum disorder if you like and and therefore all this other practical question when to see a doctor and what to be eliminated um, are extremely individual specific which brings us actually back to what uh, Kate was presenting namely that each person is it represents a unique case. I think uh, why I find this question particularly interesting that actually when to see a doctor is not, what needs to be understood that when to see a doctor is not a question of a disease. But I guess what Kate was presenting to us is, is more of a question uh, when this particular individual with this particular condition should see a, a, a doctor because it's very tuned to specific genetic and epigenetic features. Uh, then there is a, um, um, uh, is there a place for written music, uh, or let's say, is there a set of rules about how epigenetic works? Yeah, I think there, there definitely are. And I, again, I want to highlight David Ellis at Rockefeller. They're really back 
well, almost 20 years ago now, coined this idea of the histone code. So it is this combination of these modifications on the histones that really is the, uh, yeah, well, the, 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 the notes for the, the genes to be played. And um, I think we, are, we understand um, very much about a handful of these modifications. So to namely um, histone acetylation, histone methylation, these types of modifications we understand quite well. Their ability to turn off or turn on expression. Um, but there are many, many modifications that we don't understand. I think there's more than a hundred different flavors of modifications on these histones that, that really we don't know the function of. And so I think there are definite rules that are emerging from the modifications that we understand. And we know that that, that landscape really can tell us, okay, well, this histone is methylated at, at this site. That's gonna mean that anything near that is gonna be expressed. If it's methylated at this site, right near that gene, it means that that gene is gonna be not expressed. So there are definitely rules. Um, and I think it's just up to us to continue to, to understand what those specific rules are. Okay. So then there's a question that I think is highly interesting about the role of virome and viruses um, in sort of regulation of our immune system. And I would like to add to this that what, uh, what do you think about viruses do you think the viruses can contribute to the genome directly? Well, this is topic which is close to, to what my lab is working yeah. on, and you have been a lab at the time when we were when we started to work on this. So, can you comment on that? Yeah. So, the virome, um, I just you know this is a, a it's a relatively new area for my lab. Um, you know these things come about by you know going to seminars and listening to talks and and and. The, a man by the name of Skip Virgin came to Harvard and, and gave a fantastic talk and really opened my eyes to this idea that viruses exist happily amongst us. And there's many viruses that don't do any harm at all. And, and, and why is that? And can they actually be beneficial to us? Um, and so we sort of took the reductionist approach of isolating viruses from colon resections and just putting them on immune cells and saying, well, what, what does it do? And it turns out we had this, you know, very black and white result where if viruses were coming from inflammatory bowel disease patients, they were very much triggering inflammation. Um, if the viruses were coming from a non-inflamed healthy intestine, they were actually beneficial and they were capable of suppressing inflammation. And so going back to the earlier question of fecal transfer, well, can we use viruses from our gut in a, in a beneficial way for therapy? So that's regulating uh, immune function with viruses that exist amongst us all the time. Mm. What Sasha has asked is, is how these viruses integrate into our own genome. And that's a, you know, that there's essentially many examples of viruses that have actually integrated into our genome over time in, ev in evolution and actually then, then regulate um, specific, you know, genes, uh, you know, well, there's a large part of that of our role is to try and keep these silent. Um, but yeah, certainly many of these viruses have integrated into our own genomes. And this is just a, you know, obviously a fascinating concept when you start to think about the virome uh, in our gut. If it's constantly there, you know, how many of these are being integrated? I don't know the answer. I think from the virome perspective, I don't know the answer. Um, but what all we've looked at is those viruses that are, that are free virions within our gut um, that are then influencing immune cells. But I think it's, a, it's an area that's ripe for investigation. There, uh, there's a very interesting question from anonymous attendee. Uh, and this is a, whether epigenetic expression, well, I would correct it, that that was epigenetic state can be inherited or is it fully environmentally dictated? So yeah, this is, this, is a, this is a hairy one, I would say, in this field. I think transgenerational inheritance of epigenetics is, uh, I think it certainly has been shown in, in C. elegans and, and, and uh, so-called lower organisms. I think we don't have great evidence uh, 
if at all in humans at this point in time. Sasha, maybe you can chime in there. Um, I think the idea of transgenerational inheritance uh, is appealing, but I think the, the scientific solid data is not there uh, in humans right now. I, I, I agree. It's just uh, in, interesting to think that there are, of course, uh, pretty remarkable cases that would argue that there is something, but that's, of course, not enough to call it real science. So at this time, sort of um, not, not quite clear, not quite clear. And um, I think conceptually it's appealing. I think the data, we, I think it's us, us scientists to, to show the data on that one. Yeah, yeah. And it's <laughs> difficult. It, I, I think a lot of it depends also on technological development because right. more or less you have to be able to track the epigenetic state of a single cell during very long, you know, during various transitions. Uh, I guess something is possible for non-dividing cells uh, that sort of get some insults and stay where they are for duration of life, like you know, cells within the liver or maybe some skin cells, non-migrating and so on, or neurons. But for dividing cells, which are, represent exactly the type of cell Kate is talking about, this is sort of a challenging question, yeah. but an interesting one. And uh, so uh, we have about, we have time for more questions, but let's go for the next one, uh, which is sort of connected to your talk and your subject, whether there is uh, something which can be defined as, sorry, personalized medicine, and uh, what is the future with for inflammatory and- Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think that, I think it's a real, I mean, I have to think it's a real possibility of, of personalised uh, epigenetic medicine. I think that, you know, to put things into perspective, as long as, you know, I remember the, fir the Nature paper came out of the sequencing of the human genome, right, you know, and that took almost a decade. And now we can just sequence our whole genome in a couple of hours for a few hundred bucks, right? So I think technology is there and I think even just in the last three to four years the the number of epigenetic techniques that have come out that has enabled us to do things faster cheaper um, really does make it a, a, a real possibility for personalized epigenetics to be included um, you know eventually you know when you go to your physician um, you can imagine a, a personalized genetics and a, and a personalized epigenetics I mean, that takes, you can imagine how many layers need to come into that. You know, we need great, you know, predictability models or predictable models. We need great, you know, computational um, prowess there. But I don't think it's beyond the realm that, you know, there will be a day where we have both personalised epigenetics and, and um, genetics. Now, I think, you know, you're all aware of companies like 23andMe and things. I think there's definitely very tight association between, you know, some genetics and disease, but there's more loose association, which is not as clear. So I think, you know, for really this to work, we need to be very confident in saying, well, yes, this epigenetic pattern would lead to, you know, increased inflammation in this individual and, and we can try to reset that. Um, and I, it's, we're not there yet, but I, I, I do think it's within the realm of possibility. Yep. Um, we have a uh, couple of minutes. So um, the, uh, there are no more questions coming. Uh, uh, oh, no, one, uh, yeah, okay, there's one more question. Uh, is there something like a, a good virus? Uh, and uh, is there a way to promote the growth of good viruses in one's gut or? Yeah. So there's definitely good viruses, um, which is a remarkable concept given what we've just all endured for the last two years. Um, there, I'll highlight a few. So there's a, a single stranded DNA virus called an anello virus. So I can almost guarantee everybody sitting here is, has a presence of this anello virus. Uh, and you are asymptomatic. Um, that has uh, definite 
benefits. Uh, it's akin to, you know, the microbiome. We've never existed without these viruses. And so there's a sort of symbiotic relationship that's occurred between our immune system and this virus. Um, there's also many bacteriophage um, that uh, happily exist amongst us. In fact, they exist within the bacteria that inhabit our gut, but also they can actually exist as free virions just lining uh, the epithelial wall. And we have evidence and others have shown that these bacteriophages actually can be taken up directly by our immune cells and then they can influence um, our uh, immune state. So it is a, it's almost a, um, you know, a misconception that, you know, all viruses are damaging. Why are they beneficial? Well, I think the, the, the idea is that, that we've never existed without them. And that at some point we've just managed to sort of reach this equilib equilibrium where they're not, they're managing to replicate without damaging us and we're, we're managing to not be harmed. And in fact, to the point we're not, we're just not harmed, but actually they are triggering very much a sort of protective anti-inflammatory pathway in these cells. And that's at least what we've shown with the collective viruses coming from a healthy gut. I think now our goal, you know, the ultimate goal is to, to pinpoint exactly which viruses in that collection are the ones that are beneficial. But it's just so, you know, we're at this sort of turning point with the virome. We can sequence all the viruses and we can tell what they, we can identify them by sequence. But now I think the next frontier will be, you know, identifying and working with individual viruses and just showing, okay, is really beneficial. And then yeah. the converse is that what we'd love to know is are there viruses that are triggering IBD, right? Is there a flare of a certain virus that, that, that's happening and then actually triggering inflammation? Okay, so yep. the last question is sort of, uh, is a great question because it, it is about being skeptic. So are these diseases are really rising or it is so that we are getting better in finding them? I think that's a, always the great question to ask, right? Is the incidence higher because we're um, more aware of them and doctors are diagnosing them? You know, the same argument has been made for, you know, autistic spectrum disorder. You know, are we just more aware of them and is that why they're being diagnosed? I think the answer is no. I think there's there's no doubt that even in short time frames of like 40, 50 years, these diseases are increasing um, to a huge level. And so I think it's good to be sceptical and I think it's really good to ask these questions, but I think in this case it's, it's absolutely clear that... Um, that these, these, the incidence of these diseases are rising. Okay. So uh, I think it was a great seminar, really wonderful questions, very clear answers. Uh, thank you, Kate, for your contribution to this series. Thank you for being such a positive, optimistic person. <laughs> and and uh, I'm absolutely delighted to see you, to see your kids. And hope next time we'll see you in person. And thank you again for everything. And I would like to also thank very much everyone on the side of Rockefeller University who managed to build this wonderful seminar. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks again to Rockefeller and to the Women in Science program. It is really a, an amazing program. <laughs>